Welcome to Strange News. In this show, we're taking a look into the news and headlines to pick out curious reports of the strange, the weird, and the mysterious. Anything from UFO news to science advancements, the paranormal, and stuff labeled fringe science and fringe phenomena. Each news item we go over in the show, I will place all the links to them in the description box below once this live show is over, as well as chapters on the timeline index. Hello and welcome to all of my first time viewers and listeners and everyone watching this live. Before we get started, I would like to mention that on Wednesday was the Secret of Skinwalker Ranch review season four, episode 10. Then on Thursday for Mysteries with a History was If Aliens Are Here, Where Are They Hiding? And today it's strange news on a Sunday instead of on a Friday. So thank you for everyone that showed up to watch this live today. You know the drill with strange news comes a gift card. So the word of the day is hashtag UFO. Why? Because it's World UFO Day. I've been wearing my little alien shirt to represent, right? This is so exciting. So that word to put in the live chat if and only if you are watching this live is hashtag UFO in all caps, preferably. And the base price is 10. If you want to make someone's day, put in a super chat that says for the gift card and I will rack that up. We are streaming on Facebook today. If you want to be a part of that drawing, those watching this on Facebook or on Twitch, you have to go on to YouTube and enter that word into the live chat. All right, let's get straight into it because there's some really good, interesting news when it comes to really UFOs. So let's get right into that. Here we go going to share my screen here as a visual aid. And those are part of the UFO community. You might be familiar with this one. And those that aren't, you're in for a surprise. So let's pull this up. All right. Because we'll be talking about Marco Rubio. So Senate Intelligence Committee Vice Chairman Marco Rubio has blown the lid off allegations of clandestine UFO retrieval and reverse engineering programs. In an exclusive interview on News Nation, Rubio revealed that high-ranking government officials have come forward with first-hand accounts of UFO-related claims that are, in his words, beyond the realm of what the Senate Intelligence Committee has ever dealt with. Rubio was cautious not to reveal who had already come forward with information as part of an investigation by Congress into the matter when he spoke to News Nation earlier this week. And he said, quote, frankly, a lot of them are very fearful, fearful of their jobs, fearful of their clearances, fearful of their career. Similarly, others involved in the investigation have been guarded about the details of the probe, which is valid. OK, it makes sense. But these startling revelations led significant weight to a bipartisan provision adopted by the Senate Intelligence Committee, which proposes to immediately suspend funding for any covert government or contractor operations involved in the retrieval and reverse engineering of non-human or exotic matter. All right, let's back that up. That sentence right there is incredibly significant. Here's what it means. It's saying if the Senate Intelligence Committee is aware of what's going on, they're going to cut all funding. Anyone that comes across any type of UFO, right, and they try to reverse engineer it or if they retrieve it, that's a big no-no. Will it become illegal? I guess we'll find out when that happens. But this is a really, really big deal. And the sad thing about this, actually, is that it's not all over the news. It's not making these huge headlines. We're seeing it on News Nation. We're seeing it, you know, in the UFO community. Great. Awesome. But we're what? 1% of, of the global population? 2%? We're tiny. And so this is such big news, but it's not being covered. Will that change? I hope so. <laughs> I really do. But um, it, it is something that that we're, we might see more of. But what Marco Rubio had mentioned to News Nation earlier this week, I mean, it, it blew the lid off for for many of us. But again, we're not we're not seeing it all over the news, everywhere on billboards in New York City, in the newspaper, all that kind of fun stuff. Yeah, we're not. 
or not seeing it. And John aside, thank you so much for the gift card. Hashtag ramen wagon. Happy UFO day, everyone. Right back at you. Looking at 20. That word is hashtag UFO for that gift card giveaway. We'll do the drawing at the very end of the show. And thank you, Chris, as well for sending in that PayPal. I really do appreciate that. That is so nice. It says, uh, and it's from memory, it says um, for the RV fund and buy something nice for Puck, but no sweets. He's got such a sweet tooth. It's going to be kind of hard for him. Okay, so moving on to this article and and, uh, what else is involved in it. Because the provision, part of the Senate version of the Intelligence Authorization Bill, um, instructs individuals with knowledge of such activities to disclose all relevant information and grants legal immunity if the information is reported appropriately within a defined time frame. The legislation, if passed, could become law this year. This intelligence bill is not the first instance of Congress addressing the possible existence of secret UFO retrieval and reverse engineering programs. The 2023 National Defense Authorization Act also established robust whistleblower protections for individuals with knowledge of secret UFO programs. Okay, with knowledge. Now, we're not saying proof here, but we're saying with knowledge. Keep that in mind. That's going to be very important as the year progresses, I see. And I think that David Grush was a really great example of this. Yes, he was you know, it's hearsay. Yes, people are really flustered about that. I get it. We all want to see alien bodies. We all want to see the paperwork. Look, I am with you on that. Are we going to get that? Probably not anytime soon, if ever. But hey, a girl can dream, right? But still, they are mentioning here with knowledge of secret UFO programs. That is a big deal. Also, Chris, I know you sent in 20 for the RV as well. So we're looking at 40 right there and then also for the RV fund. So thank you for that. So the Senate Intelligence Committee's legislation goes further than previous laws. This is like a gift that keeps on giving and it's not even Christmas. If enacted, the legislation would halt funding for any secret unreported programs that engage in analyzing retrieved UFOs. Funding would be cut for the development of propulsion technology or aerospace craft that uses technology derived from or inspired by recovered UFOs. Dun, dun, dun. That dun, dun, dun could not be more appropriate. Okay. So these kinds of statements are absolutely huge and they are going a long way to adding credibility to the statements made by whistleblower David Grush. So as the veil of secrecy begins to lift, we're left to question what otherworldly revelations await us in the shadows. All right, let's hear your thoughts on this. Do you think we can see this progressing to being becoming more significant when it comes to the government? Are we going to do you think the public is going to receive more information on this? I'll tell you this. I thought it was a really, really big deal for Marco Rubio to even come forward and mention the things that he did in a pretty short interview. You can find it online. And again, it's under News Nation. Totally recommend watching it. But he was saying people have already come forward. People have already been have been speaking to us and telling us their information, but we're being very guarded on the people uh, for these people. We don't want to give out their names or we don't want to, you know, make them public for the time being. And th- th- there's that like that, um, I guess, trust factor there. These people that are coming forward to these other government officials, such as Marco Rubio, they are trusting Marco enough to say, hey, I know this, this, and this. Keep this information under your hat for the time being, but just wait, buddy, because in time, it might be relevant in the near future. Now, 2023 has been an incredible hot year when it comes to UFO news. Now, I'm not saying UFO transparency. I'm not saying UFO disclosure because yes, we we've been, you know, trekking our way up there, but we we haven't received any smoking gun evidence yet. Will that happen? Once again, a girl can dream, right? I would love that. But I guess we can only see what the future holds for us. But let's 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 hear what you have to say on this. Chris says, "I'm not holding my breath." the DOD coming forward with their data. Hey, I think the majority of people are are 
on the same wavelength as yourself because most people are thinking the same. And good evening from Wales, says Vivian. Well, hello. Hello there. So share your thoughts in the live chat, definitely in the comments as well. I do read all of the comments and I'm sorry. I feel like I just, I have like too much blush on. So we'll just take that off. Okay. But moving on, we're still in the conversation of UFOs and we're still kind of in the same conversation when it comes to the government. This is also like pretty exciting information. So let's pull this one up. This is another person um, that has spoken a handful of times about UFOs. So you're probably familiar with this face. And this is Senator Kristen Gillibrand. And she announced that she and other lawmakers had secured full funding for a new U.S. Department of Defense office specifically created to research unidentified aerial phenomena sightings. Dun, dun, dun. So the announcement follows years of Gillibrand and other lawmakers like Senator Marco Rubio trying to allocate full funding for the government office designed to study signings of what are more commonly known as UFOs. All right, let's back it up to our knowledge when it comes to any UFO office, right? Well, let's just go back a few months to the Aero funding meeting, okay, hearing. The most disappointing aspect of that hearing was, yeah, the money factor. Yeah, always disappointing. But it was when Dr. Kirkpatrick had mentioned, we want to make a UFO into someone else's problem, an SEP. All right. That broke my heart when I heard that. And so now Gillibrand wants to create and is wants to create another full funded office to look at ufo sightings now how is that going to differ from arrow well let's continue on because the announcement fall oh i already read that <laughs> so in a press release put out by her office last week Gillibrand, also the chair of the senate armed services emerging threats and capabilities subcommittee imagine wearing that title on your badge man that font's gonna be like a font eight right announced she had secured full funding for the All-Domain Anomaly Resolution Office in the Senate Armed Services Committee uh, markup of the Fiscal Year 2024 National Defense Authorization Act. Okay, so you're listening to this, right? So Arrow is now getting the funding that it needs, which Kirkpatrick had also mentioned in that funding hearing a few months back saying, look, we need more money to do better research. We need more people on the team in order to dissect and review the data that we have collected. And if there are people that want to come forward and be classified as a witness, please do so. And we will document that information. You feel me? Okay. So there, she's not creating a new office. She's just saying we are now giving Arrow full funding in order to conduct their research, which is great, which is great. Now, with full funding, because you and I, people in the States, we're paying for that with their tax dollars. And let me tell you, it hurts paying taxes from time to time. But if that's the case, if they're going to receive full funding, will the information that they collect be fully public? Well, the answer is going to be no. Yes, the public is going to receive a report as they should every single year. That was what was agreed upon a while back. But of course, there's going to be an open hearing and a closed door hearing. And You know, we, we all want to be that fly on the wall during those closed door hearings and hear all the juicy details. Spill the tea, as they say these days. Very much like that. Are we going to get that, you and I, the your, your, your average citizen? No, probably not. So the release described that Gillibrand and Rubio collaborated on the creation of the office in order to help the DOD with, quote, resolving UAP sightings, improve data sharing between DOD and the intelligence community on UAP sightings, addressing national security concerns, reporting how the facts people may experience in relation to UAP events. Wow, 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 wow. This is something that has been pushed for for some time in the sense of what is the correlation between people's health effects and encountering or being close to a UFO. 
this is huge and they want to do research onto that. Yes, people have been doing that for some time now, but for the government to do that and to hopefully make that information public, that is so, so awesome. Also, for those that didn't watch the UAP hearing, uh, I will br quickly brief you on this. Not only was it just, hey, we need more funding in order to do better research and to have more people on the team, we also want access to what private project, black projects have done, what other pe people in the government have done, so that we do not, we do not have repetitive data. Meaning, that when Arrow started, at least from my understanding, from what Dr. Kirkpatrick had mentioned in that hearing, he was saying, we, were we weren't given a lot of information. Yes, from a few decades back, like from the UAPTF and things of that nature. But these other projects that, were, that we don't know of, like that we don't know the name of, we weren't provided that information. Well, Gillibrand, she had her ears perked up. She says, hey, buddy, I hear you. I feel you. I got this. And so she wants to resolve and improve data sharing between the DOD and the intelligence community on UAP sightings. That's going to be a significant boost up in research when it comes to Arrow's team. All right. Big, big, big deal. And according to the release's description, the office has access to DOD and intelligence community data and is required to provide Congress with briefings and reports on UAPs. Now, here's the interesting thing about uh, the government and when it comes to UAP, UAPs. And I've said it before, and I'm going to say it again. They can't decide if it's plural or singular. Is it UAP? Is it UAPs? Is it phenomenon? Is it phenomenon? We don't know. <laughs> and and you will, if you're involved in the community and you hear people talk about this new term, and that's in quotation marks, new, uh, it's, it's interchangeable between plural and singular. <laughs> and they haven't decided themselves either. So a report from the director of national intelligence that came out in January claimed that UAP sightings have surged in the last two years. And as you know, more than 366 UAP sightings during that time frame have been reported to Arrow. Until very recently, getting the office fully funded and operational has eluded Gillibrand, Rubio, and other lawmakers who supported its creation. Though the lawmakers secured funding for the creation of the office in the National Defense Authorization Agreement, the national defense budget for the 2022 fiscal year, they weren't authorized for adequate funding for that year and the next. In a press release from February, Gillibrand office noted that fiscal year 2023 funding falls short of what Aero needs to fulfill its mission and maintain American air supremacy. The release featured a letter um, endorsed by Rubio, Gillibrand, along with Warren as well and Graham and other lawmakers asking, recom asking recommending the NDAA secure and necessary funding. All right. And this article goes into more detail. I will place that link below for you to read more into that. But the takeaway from this particular article is Arrow is now getting full funding. Arrow is now going to hopefully be able to collect better and more data. And on top of that, hopefully, and this is just a little hopeful thing here, sprinkle in, sprinkle in, in my delicious cake sprinkles, is hopefully the information that they collect, they provide to the public, like you and me, right? That That's what I'm hoping for. But... As I had said when the show started, that word is hashtag UFO. Why is it? Because it's World UFO Day. Hello, welcome, let's celebrate. This is a great day. So let's get into that. Like for those that are thinking, what the heck is World UFO Day? Is that even a real thing? Surprisingly, yes. Yes, it is. So let's pull this up as a visual aid, of course. Do 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 do. Okay. Beautiful. There is that image. See? There's even these posters. Does that make it legit? It sure does. So World UFO Day is an annual worldwide celebration that takes place on either July 2nd or June 24th. 
well, that's random, depending on the tradition followed. It aims to promote the gathering of people who are interested in observing the skies for UFOs. Meow, meow, meow. Peace of mind says, isn't every day you, little world UFO day for you and me? Yes, it is. For your average person? No. No, it is not. But should it be? Yes, it should. Should be like a whole month celebration. That's so awesome. Right? Trent says, cool, happy UFO day and 4th of July weekend. Whoop, whoop. Happy Independence Day, everyone. Ian read my mind. Yep, that's right. Maybe I'm behind. Chris says, loving the sound effects today, Christina. Beats AI. Thank you. Appreciate that. Thank you, thank you. Okay, so getting into this. The date, June 24th, is significant as it marks the first widely reported UFO sighting in the United States. But here's the history when it comes to World UFO Day. Because in on January 2nd, 1952, a significant event took place in Washington, D.C., involving multiple sightings of UFOs. These sightings were not only reported by numerous individuals, but were also confirmed by radar operators and witnessed by experienced pilots. The incident garnered attention from the public, increasing their fascination with UFOs and prompting government investigations into these phenomena. World UFO Day was officially st established in 2001 by a Turkish UFO researcher, and initially it was celebrated on June 24th to uh, celebrate the first widely reported UFO sighting in the U.S. How or however, how order? Because I read order at the same time. However, in order to avoid conflict with other UFO-related events, shrug shoulders, the date was later changed to July 2nd. This change was made to um was made for the significant UFO sightings that occurred over Washington, D.C. on July 2nd, 1952. Now, World UFO Day holds significance, like this is, a, this is a big deal, as it serves as a platform to foster open discussions and debates regarding the existence of extraterrestrial life by encouraging the free exchange of ideas and theories. This day promotes a broader understanding of the possibility that we are not alone in the universe. It prompts individuals to contemplate our position in the vast cosmos and embrace the concept of life beyond Earth. Now, you might think to yourself, but Christina, how do I celebrate World UFO Day? What do I have to do in order to celebrate it right Hang tight. I got you. Because you can take part in UFO conventions. Numerous UFO conventions take place worldwide throughout the year, providing excellent opportunities to expand knowledge about UFOs, connecting with fellow enthusiasts, and exploring exhibits showcasing UFO sightings. These events serve as valuable gatherings for learning and networking within the UFO community, offering a platform to delve deeper into the subject and engage with like-minded individuals. Now, if you don't want to go to a UFO converse, converse uh, convention, but you do want to speak to like-minded individuals, you can join my Discord server with 2,000 other like-minded members. It is a friendly, safe, and secure place. It's also troll-free. I have great moderators in there, and I know one of them will place that link in the live chat for you to join in. But what else can you do to celebrate today? Well, you can research about UFOs, and if you are, you came to the right place. Because there's also a wide range of books on UFOs that are readily available for reading, offering ample opportunities to explore the subject in depth. Additionally, numerous documentaries focusing on UFOs are accessible for viewing, providing visual and audio accounts of these phenomena. You know what? Put it down below, either in the comments or in the live chat, your all-time favorite UFO book and your all-time favorite UFO documentary slash movie. 
I want to hear them all. I want to hear all the ideas because maybe there's a book or a movie that you write down that I haven't seen or read. I'm down. I'm ready to celebrate this day right. So tell me your favorite book, your favorite movie when it comes to UFOs. Maybe you'll also inspire someone else as well. But at the same time, you came to the right place because this channel grew from the ground when it comes to UFOs. Like, that's how this channel started. Then it evolved and went into other wild things. But it all started with UFOs. Cool stuff. And he says, Paul. Like, the movie Paul? That's a pretty funny one. Also, like, the... Um, the Guardian's Guide to the Galaxy, also pretty good. Peace of Mind says, Chariots of the Gaunts was the first one I ever read. That one got a lot of people interested in UFOs. Like, that was a lot of people's first book. Very cool. And Irvin, thank you so much. I will be celebrating World UFO Day by taking a trip to a beach here in Japan. Oh, whoops. I missed it. Ah. Well, my mother-in-law experienced and encountered multiple orbs. Wow. That is so cool. Send us pictures. Oh, and it, okay. All right. Here, here is some great advice for World UFO Day. For those that want to see a UFO and that want to capture it on, on film, and that, that word is very specific, by yourself, by your friend, by a family member, a Polaroid camera, a film camera. Because these days, with our super expensive cell phones, we capture blobs, these little blobs of light that look crappy, like so bad. But back in the day, people were using film cameras. You could see the details on those UFOs. So, so listen, listen. If you want to celebrate today and you don't have a film or Polaroid camera, Get yourself one and then go UFO hunting. Go have fun. <laughs> Do all that fun stuff. Or if you're really feeling it, you can also get a Nikon Cool Pix P1000. Crazy zoom, by the way. But that's kind of more on the expensive side. Film, Polaroid, those aren't too bad. But the Nikon Cool Pix P1000, beautiful, amazing, love it. But thank you so much for that. And uh, did I miss this one? No. Okay. Awesome. And if you didn't know, the um, optimal zoom is 125. Like zoom. Pretty. I mean, that's crazy, right? Yeah. Irvin says, looks like I'm buying a Polaroid camera too. You're, you better. You, if you're going to go and look at UFOs, you better do it right. <laughs> before you get like all the other really fancy equipment, right? And also good for ghosts too. So I've been told. <laughs> <sighs> all right, moving on. Moving on because uh, we're still talking about UFOs um, and also Harvard professor Abby Loeb. Why? As some of you know, he did go to Papua New Guinea uh, to look for, like, UFO debris. He found some stuff. So we're going to be covering that. Here's Abby Lowe. For those that don't know, he is a Harvard professor. Also, the creator of the Galileo Project, where he says the skies are unclassified. If you want to know more about him, I did interview him. You can find that right here on this channel, where we go into depth on his work, his research, and his ideas as well when it comes to UFOs. All right? So microscopic remnants from what could be a unidentified space object that crashed into the Pacific Ocean about a decade ago have been found. And a Harvard scientist hopes that they are proof of an advanced alien civilization. Harvard professor Avi Loeb and his team went on a historic expedition and managed to collect 50 microscopic particle spheres that look like specks of dust weighing in a collective 35 milligrams off the coast of Papua New Guinea. Loeb noticed a runway fireball in 2014 that exploded in the lower atmosphere and then fell into the ocean. The object, labeled 
I am one is actually tougher and has material strength that is higher than all the space rocks that were cut along by cut alone by NASA. This is what he had mentioned to Fox News. He said, this makes it quite unusual. He continues, given um, I am one's high speed and anomalous material strength, its source must have been a natural environment different from the solar system or an extraterrestrial technological civilization. The researcher says that the particle they uncovered were perfectly round. And here's a picture. Here's another picture. This one looks a little better. It's coming from his uh, laptop here. So once an inspected under a microscope, he said, the objects appear to look like a molten raindrop. He continues, my daughter asked me if she could put one on a necklace, <laughs> but I told her it's too small to bead. Hold up, back it up. Already, his daughter's the cutest thing ever. That is, that, <laughs> that is so cute. He also says, this could be the first time humans put their hands on interstellar material. This has never been done before. We never received a package at our doorstep from a cosmic, cosmic neighbor. The process of collecting microscopic space materials from under the ocean in itself was a task. Because Professor Avi Loeb and his team basically used powerful magnets that were able to follow the trajectory taken by the original space object, using the magnet to collect the particles on the way. That is so smart. Because could you just imagine you're casually scuba diving and you're looking for these little microscopic beads? Good luck. Yeah, have, have fun combing through the sand trying to do that. But using a magnet, like it's common sense, and yet it's genius. Common sense genius. That should be trademarked right there. <laughs> he says here that the interpretation will be left to follow-up papers. And he did write about 33 essays, and you can find those on the debrief. But in response to the naysayers, we say nothing other than show our data in our first publication. One cannot argue with facts, only with interpretations, he said. The team plans to take the particles back to the lab, analyze the elemental uh, composition, and then report the data in a paper submitted to a peer-reviewed journal according to the original report. Here's what I've heard a lot of people complain about. Well, if he's a scientist, why is he writing a peer-reviewed journal, peer-reviewed paper and submitting it to a journal? He heard you and he's doing it right now. Now, to be fair, he's written a lot of peer-reviewed papers, but in this case, this information will be made public and it will be peer-reviewed. This is this is, this is huge. This is great information. So while the trip was historic and successful, according to Avi Loeb, the most important part of the expedition is to answer the question, are we alone? Professor Avi Loeb previously claimed aliens visited Earth in 2007, but scientists ignored them as he argued with the best explanation for a highly unusual interstellar object caught speeding through our solar system five years ago was that it was alien technology, and he was referring to Oumuamua. For those that aren't familiar with Avi Loeb's backstory, that's how he got famous. That's how he got really loved by the UFO community. He sold this super long... Um, cigar shaped object. And he says, that might be alien tech. That, that's pretty cool, right? And everyone else was saying, Abby Loeb, you're off your rocker. What are you doing here? But yet, with that statement that he made, he gained a lot of fame. Um, he's written a significant amount of books. He did work with Stephen Hawking as well before he passed, of course, and now doing these. Uh, this this trip to Papua New Guinea. So it's a lot of things in one, but it's something that is um, truly interesting when it comes to his work and his very imaginative, creative, and smart mind as well. Because he's thinking outside of the box, which many scientists in some respects are scared to do because at the end of the day, when you want to do science, you got to have really good funding. And to have really good funding, you got to kind of fit inside of this box and think to yourself, 
who is willing to fund my project, right? He's thinking, yeah, I don't care. I'm going to go for it. And whoever wants to fund it can fund it. And I dig that. All right. Getting into our next article. We're getting into the more into the paranormal. So let's pull this one up. This one is just as a visual aid. But let me ask you this before we even start. How many of you have watched the movie Venom? Okay, because that's going to be relevant for today. For this article, to be exact. Have I watched it? You, no, I haven't. So I, I was a bit behind when I read this. But if you have watched the movie or if you're familiar with the comics, you're going to get this article. So... They were singular Fortin Society was recently put into contact with an investigator who said that he had seen a strange spiritual entity on his way to an investigation. See, that's that's what we all want. All of us investigators were thinking, okay, today's gonna be my good strange day. Today is gonna be wild. It happened to this guy. So a 57-year-old investigator was driving with a friend on US-77 in Texas and had just passed I-10 on May 27th at approximately 11.30 p.m. when he saw what he would describe later as a 1.5-inch by 1.5-inch dark square being moving across the road. That's pretty crazy. No, I think that's a foot. 1.5 feet. Excuse me on that. All right. So it says here, we were going to investigate, do an investigation in Texas. And as we were driving on the left, on the left from where oncoming traffic would be coming from, this was a two lane highway, one way each way. And I saw something crawling in the road. What was weird was that it was black, it was dark, and it, the best way to describe it is to picture a square. It was a square, no arms or legs, but the corners were stretching out to walk. The man described the entity's movement as being similar to the symbiote from the movie Venom, in that it stretched and you know, it, it, it moved itself in such a weird way. He said that it was that this person described the creature as having a round body and initially thought it was a pig until it mysteriously vanished. So it went from square to round. Huh. Spooky. It also says here that she said that she thought it was a pig because of its shape and because it was walking in the woods off the road, but that it wasn't a pig because it disappeared. So it was two investigators, one male and one female. And then, as their vehicle passed the mysterious square entity, he lost sight of it. And the man said he felt something cold. He suddenly felt a chill up his spine. He says here, I felt it like being attached to my vehicle. I got really cold. I'm a paranormal investigator. I've been doing this for 14 or 15 years. I've dealt with a lot of stuff. I've felt a lot of stuff. And I had never felt or seen anything like this before. You could feel the cold. I turned to my friend and said, something is here with us. Now, he tried telling the entity that it was not welcomed. But he said, it just wouldn't leave. This thing, for a lack of a better term, latched onto me. And after meeting several friends at the site of their investigation, the man was told that he that he didn't look like himself and and sprinkled uh, with holy water, as it says here. His friends then offered to smudge him with sage, which reportedly began to burn a greenish color and making a popping sound. And the investigator says it was really weird at this point, the entity which the man said. Uh, he felt between his t-shirt and skin, he could no longer see. And, and it left through his shirt sleeve. He says, I know I sound crazy, but this thing was running around inside of me, he said. Okay. So this is, this is a really weird story. It definitely belongs in a paranormal book. But let's say this were to actually happen, all right? Let's 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 just muse ourselves just for a moment. Let's just indulge ourselves in our imagination. 
you're going on an investigation, right? You are prepared for the strange. You are psyched. You are so excited. You're driving on the road and you see this little square black blob moving around like in Venom, right? I'd pee myself right there without question. Then on top of that, person that you're with is saying, well, I'm seeing it as being round, but I'm seeing it as being square. Which one is right? Don't know. But then it gets even weirder. It's like this thing latches on to the investigator and he says, dude, buddy, home slice. You're not welcomed here. And so he goes to his friend's place, hangs out with them. They smudge him with sage. And if you've ever been smudged with sage, right, that smoke, it's it's white. And for, for him to explain saying that it was green in color and making a popping sound, either he's lying, he was hallucinating, or something totally crazy was going on there. You get three options, four if you're lucky or if you're like really imaginative, right? But um, that, that detail right there, I've never heard anything like that before. But, but before I even continue, share with me your thoughts on this is it crazy is it legit in your opinion do you think it's a little fact with fiction here do you think it's all true well his name wasn't disclosed we didn't get his information we don't know who this investigator is who supposedly has been investigating the paranormal for 14 or 15 years great you know good good for you but i feel like i need a little bit more information to be on the bandwagon right but let's continue on with this excuse me He said that the entity felt smaller than it had looked uh, in the road when it was attached and that it almost felt like an air pocket. As it moved, you could feel the trail, almost as if it was dragging a tail. So you have a black box blob with a tail. Uh Uh-uh. Not no. But concerning for his friend's safety, the man said that he placed his hand on her and commanded the entity to come back to him. So it, so it went from one person to another. The guy says, oh, my gosh, it just got passed on. Let me take this entity back. So it does exactly that. This weird entity goes back to the guy. But then he feels like the entity became weaker and weaker until he, until he no longer felt anything. Now, during the course of the investigation, the man said that they were able to use a K2 meter to communicate with something which informed them that the entity had been summoned specifically to harm the friend who had experienced the more pronounced reaction to the entity's attachment. The man said that he suspected the entity was conjured through brujeria, which is witchcraft, by someone jealous of the people he's hanging around with, but otherwise declined to elaborate. Okay, so based on this case, we're dealing with witchcraft. Is it a real thing? Look, I have come across a handful of stories about witchcraft. I have known people personally who have been, have gotten the, the aftermath of witchcraft, not them practicing it, but what you'd be classified as being cursed, right? I've, I'm, people have told me stories, those that are my friends and those that have wrote, written me emails as well. I've come across stories like this, not like this, but about people practicing that, um, which, you know, everything has a cause and effect, right? What you're going to do is either going to come back to you or if you know what you're doing, it's going to be very dangerous for someone else. Now, you can make up your own mind if you believe in it or not. That's not my place to tell you what to do or what to think. But for this investigator to say, my gut feeling is that someone was practicing witchcraft, you're probably not wrong. That's just my opinion right there but let's hear what you have to say about it oscar says life tip don't conjure up something from beyond yeah yeah i'm with you on that one careful what you wish for really if you see a genie in a bottle best to just leave it alone 
peace of mind says Christina and tell them about the possessed vacuum story you want to hear a personal story about a cursed vacuum that I encountered I'll, I'll give you the really brief abridged version here the cliff notes version here's what happened my freshman year in college okay I had no money to buy a vacuum cleaner so I sat next to this one girl in one of my classes and I said hey friend <laughs> can I borrow your vacuum cleaner? I, I just I just need to borrow it just for a few hours. Is that okay? She's like, sure, no problem. Come pick it up and drop it off whenever you feel like it. And I'm like, dude, you're the best. Thank you so much for that. So I pick it up. We chat for a bit. And then I pick up the vacuum, take it back home. And while I'm driving home with the vacuum in the trunk of the car, I'm thinking to myself, I look behind me. I'm thinking, is there someone in the car with me? There's no way. It's just me in the vacuum. Like, what the heck? There, there could be nothing in there but me. But I felt like something was there. But I brushed it off. This was before I was really interested in the paranormal, into UFOs, and doing extensive research into these things. I was kind of more of, I don't really believe too much in gut feelings. It's about the data, the science, and nuts and bolts, right? So I get home. I put it in the corner of, of my place. And I started cleaning up the house, getting ready to, to vacuum. Now, during this time frame, I used to have this really big, like, one-pound candle in a glass jar in the bathroom on top of the toilet. Okay? And this thing could not move. I mean, it was, it was a heavy candle. And it was just me in the place. And I'm just cleaning up the place, getting ready to vacuum. And then I hear the candle just fall. And I think, well, that's weird. And it falls right into the trash can. I pick up this really heavy candle, put it back on the toilet, continue doing my things. But then it happened again. And I thought, now this is whack. Let me go to my television knowledge when it comes to ghosts and sprinkle some salt in that bad boy. So I grab salt from the cabinet and I sprinkle it like the meme in the candle. Okay. But that didn't work. I, that didn't work. It just got worse. And I think to myself, this didn't happen until I brought the haunted vacuum into my place. So then using my television knowledge, again, this is before I was interested in paranormal investigations, right? And doing the research. I sprinkled that salt right behind the front door. Did that help? No, it did not. So then I'm thinking, okay, I have a demon in my house. <laughs> that is the only explanation. Demons. So what do I do? I type it into Google. And I said, Google, buddy, help me out. How can I, what tunes can I put to get rid of this ghost entity? So I play some, like, chants, do all that fun stuff. And then I hear this screeching sound coming out of the speakers. That was not a part of the soundtrack. My computer was totally fine. I called up that girl who lent me the vacuum and I said, hey, can I return your vacuum to you like ASAP, like right now? She says, Christina, it's 10 p.m. Drop it off tomorrow. And I said, no, please, please take back your vacuum. She's like, no, no, tomorrow. It's late. I said, oh, geez, Jesus Christ. So I put that vacuum in the storage and I said, look, you're going to stay there until I take you back home in the morning. You hear me? You cannot leave this storage until the morning. I drop off the vacuum the very next day. Never spoke to that girl again. Will that have changed if that were to happen a few days ago or tomorrow? Yes, I would be interviewing the fire out of that girl, asking her all of the craziest questions, really getting an understanding of that vacuum and all the things that has happened to her since she had the vacuum. But I didn't do that at the time. Instead... I just shut that door and I walked away and I never looked back. And that's the story of the haunted vacuum. Hopefully you found that interesting. <laughs> yeah, this is true. This is true. Moving on to our next article here. I'm actually going to skip that one. I let's just get that one too. Okay, this one's pretty cool. Let's get into this one. Where are we? I can find my pictures for this one. Now we're going to skip that one too. I have so many articles for you. It's a limited time. We're going to get into the cool, the cool stuff. Okay, here we go. 
This one's weird. And I like this one. And decently appropriate for coming after the haunted vacuum story. Let's pull up this 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 picture. Yeah, interview with the vacuum. You know, I should have done that. I should have gotten my EVP recorder, right? Um, and and just start asking the vacuum questions and hoping for the best. But see, I didn't do any. You know, I'm really disappointed in my past self for not doing any of those things. And now I lost contact with that girl and I can never ask her those questions again. Such a sad story. Okay, but let's get into this one. Because over the last week, people have been debating whether they would stay in the catacombs of Paris for $10 million. Now, this debate is entirely hypothetical, started by the account of creepy.org on Twitter. And $10 million is a lot of money. So why aren't people keen? Well, as well as concerns about respect for the dead, it might be because of the fear of piles and piles of skulls and bones that are down there. And we're talking about millions of bones okay in the catacombs in in paris look at these images okay you're seeing like some nice looking white blobs no no those are skulls femurs all of that wax stuff all right and these catacombs they are filled to the brim with dead bodies. So in the 18th century in Paris, the cemeteries were overflowing. Everyone was dying. And having used several large central graveyard for centuries, Louis the 15th ordered in 1763 that no more bodies will be placed inside of the capital, giving the incredible stretch coming from the cemeteries and the rotting flesh they contained. So while uh, a good step, you know, the, the problems weren't over. The church continued to bury people within the city until an alternative could be found. And as well as this, the bodies that were already in the remains, like already in the cemeteries, really stunk up the place with no plans to move them. Because if you've encountered anything rotting, have it be in your refrigerator, like some like vegetables or lemons, I don't know, whatever, right? Or even if you're a hunter or like you like to go outside and you see like rotting animals, I know really gross, really sad, but it's a thing. They smell, I mean, nasty. So imagine like, Smelling that times a thousand. So many other bodies in a confined space, right? Brutal. You would probably throw up all over the floor. And then the smell of that throw will make you throw up even more. But in 1780, some of these bodies were freed once more. So after months of heavy rain, an underground wall separated the infamous less incidents innocence graveyard from a cellar of a house which collapsed causing many bodies to spill into the house okay you're casually having tea you're having your nice breakfast or lunch everything is great you're reading the newspaper you're listening to the thunder and then you hear a knock on the door all right you're like oh who is here at this hour you keep hearing this knocking it's becoming more intense right and then before you can even open it all of these bodies just come through the door, come through the walls, come through the windows. That is a horror movie that I don't think anyone would ever want to experience. Well, apparently that happened. So after an outbreak of disease, more effort was put into finding a place as a retainer for the city's six million corpses. I don't even know 100 people. Could you imagine six million? Could you imagine just casually sitting in your house, having a nice cup of tea, cup of coffee, and they all just like spill into your home like unwanted guests? At least bring a housewarming gift. Other than a smell. That'd be great. Um, no, thank you. Big pass. If you are enjoying what you're hearing so far, hit the like button. Subscribe if you haven't already. And that word is hashtag UFO for that gift card. For Starbucks or Amazon, we'll be doing the drawing at the end of the show. I like drop my post-it notes. So 
but I remembered it. We're A-OK. -okay. We're looking at 40. If you want to make someone's day, put a super chat, super sticker, super chat for the gift card, and I will rack that up. Keto key. Was it 40? I think it was 50. Hold on. No. Yeah. Excuse me. OK. So at first, the tunnels were a bit unorganized, messed, you know, like, like this big mess. There was a lot of bones and skulls. But then an artist came along, and he's like, Mwah, let's make this into an art piece. And he started stacking them up like this. Is that actually what happened? I have no idea. But if, I mean, this is a tourist attraction. People can go in now. But if you look at this, I mean, this took precision. This took like a visionary eye to say, we're going to stack them up like this. And we're going to do it like this and do it like that. And then voila, here is our masterpiece, right? Either you're super morbid or you're just totally detached from death. Or both. I don't know. But the big question is, after looking at these images, hearing these stories of millions and millions of bones in these catacombs, would you spend the night there? Well, this place is haunted, without a doubt. I had Jeff Belanger on. He is a f amazing storyteller. I mean, he is like what would be classified as professional storyteller. He's amazing. Okay. I had him on the show a while back, and he mentioned in that interview that... I think it was his first ghost encounter actually happened in one of these catacombs in Paris. Crazy, right? The place is haunted. Well, in the early 1990s, a group of people who study and explore the Paris catacombs regularly found a video camera on the ground. The footage showed a man who was lost and seemed to be going mad in the underground network of tunnels. The video ends abruptly with the man dropping his camera to the ground. And to this day, no one knows who he was or if he ever managed to get out alive. All right, not super significant, but listen to this. Secret, in 2004, a group of police officers were exploring a part of the Paris catacombs restricted from public access when they uncovered some very strange things. They found a bar, a living room, workshop, lounge, and even a cinema with the room to seat 20 people. Shockingly, the cinema seats had been carved into the stone of the catacombs. Now, the creepiest part of it all was that after they discovered the cameras on the ceilings recording them, a few days later, when the police returned back to that area of the catacombs, everything that they had supposedly discovered vanished. And all that remained was a note that read, don't search. Dun, dun, dun. That's pretty freaky. Um, people, people, okay? People are scary. People are dangerous. People are whack. Can I expect this? Oh, yeah. I, I can expect someone digging a little hole in a catacomb and, you know, making it feel like home. Oh, yeah. Without question. But as a policeman, right, like you're doing your job, you find this weird stuff, you see cameras, you look up and he said, oh, I got you. You're going to jail, right? Because this is, you know, private property. You come back and everything is gone. That's a story for the books right there. Pretty freaky. Oop. Scarlet says, don't fear having no friends. Fear having bad friends. Benjamin Franklin. Oh, yeah. Also, another one is don't fear the dead. Fear the living, right? The dead, yeah, they can scare you. Yeah, they can maybe influence you to do certain things, right? But only to an extent. Anyone casually can hurt you in a second in any possible way, right? The dead, really not so much. They're just scary. But living people, they're terrifying. <laughs> Hyde says, four more likes to 200. Come on, hit that like button. It lets me know you're enjoying the show. And it also allows more UFO content to be on your main YouTube page as well, which is great. And put that word in hashtag UFO. Let's see how many entries we have. 55 entries. All right, let's make that into 90. Come on. I'm going to share my screen here so I everyone can put that in. Here it is. Okay. That hash that word is hashtag UFO for World UFO Day. 
you have 55 entries. Let's get to 90 for a $40 Starbucks or Amazon gift card. We'll do that drawing at the very end of the show, which is going to be pretty darn soon. If you are watching this on Facebook or on Twitch, you have to go to the YouTube live chat in order to put in hashtag UFO if you want to participate in the drawing. Paul says the living will hurt you more. Oh, yeah. Julie says, imagine all those coming back to life. Like, I feel like that was in an episode, no, in a movie of Pirates of the Caribbean. Maybe not the first one. I don't know. It's been such a long time since I've seen that movie. But I'm pretty sure this might have been the second one where all these skeleton pirates, right, were trying to capture Captain Jack Sparrow. Am I right? I don't know. Correct me if I'm not. Because <laughs> I'm not sure. But... Yes, there are a few movies that kind of follow that idea. And it, it's scary. It's very scary. Thanks, Andres. Thank you for that. All right, 72 entries. I'm going to put this up. I'm going to leave this up while I continue on with the next article. Actually, no, I got to show images for this next one. This one is, it's crazy, it's wild, and it's stupid. All right. So just keep on putting in that word. But let's let's pull this up. Because this is strange, and this is strange news. So, of course, we're going to be covering this. Now, for those in the fashion world, might, you might already know this one. But if you're an average person, you probably don't. Because this object that we're seeing right here was created by Brooklyn-based art collective MSCHF. That is not, that does not roll off the tongue nicely. Okay? And is inspired by popular Louis Vuitton design. It's even embezzled the iconic brand's uh, signature LV on the front. Now, here's the significance about this purse. You're like, Christina, why are you talking about this? Hold, just, just listen to this. Because what we're seeing right here is a microscopic handbag, all right, where it, it is narrow enough to fit through the eye of a needle, and it is only 600 57 by 222 by 700 microns, okay? You need to see this through a microscope to see this purse, all right? Now, the fluorescent yellow-green bag was made by using a process called two-photon um, polymeseration, a manufacturing technology that used to 3D print tiny plastic parts. Okay, but here's the more crazy thing. For this microscopic bag that you will lose in a heartbeat is selling for $3,000 to $4,000. I'm upset. What the heck? All right. It's smaller than a grain of salt. Okay. And it's... Ugh. Some people have more money than they do cents. All right. Why, why, why would you sell it for several thousands of dollars that you can never use and you can't show anyone unless you have a microscope? All right. Let's see that other image. All right. Here is it on someone's finger. Look at that. Look at that. Dude. Some people just shouldn't have money. They just shouldn't. A look at that image right there. And if you are listening to this on a podcast platform, jump over to YouTube. That link is below to see how tiny this purse is on someone's finger. Yeah. Depressing. Really. Well, let's pull this up. We got 78 entries. Come on, guys. Get to 90. We have 256 people watching this live. Thank you, by the way. But let's get to 90 entries. A hashtag UFO and um, Mark, thank you so much. Is that for the gift card? Is it for the channel? Please let me know so I can write that up accordingly. Because I'm looking, 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 and I'm not seeing it. So, yeah, Mark, please let me know. <sighs> but out of all the articles, yeah, right, David? It's a green booger bag. Oh, for sure. Out of all the articles that we covered, which one was your favorite? Let me know in the live chat. Let me know in the comments. I do read all of the comments. And also share your insights on these articles. Uh, like, 
in the sense of what you thought about them, what extra information you could provide regarding the things that we covered, right? Julia says, a fool will buy it. Yeah, and there's there's a lot of those. But for so much money, it's unbelievable. Ooh, my eyeball was itchy. Ah. All right, should we do the, come on. Okay, just, just five more entries. Let's just do five. Hashtag UFO. If you're watching this on Facebook or on Twitch, jump over to YouTube, put that word in the live chat so you can participate in the drawing. All righty. Oh, thank you, Mark. I appreciate that. You're so nice. Jonas Hyde says, the UFO Day article. Of course, it has to be the best favorite one, right? Because it's UFO Day. Has to be. But let's let's hear it. Who other who else liked the story? Ah, uh, Andres says, I like the vacuum ghost story the most. Thank you. It was it was prompted by peace of mind. <laughs> right, photo? I put my tardigrade in that. You probably could and carried it around. <laughs> Thank you, Chris. Thank you. Amen, Scarlet. That is so right right there. Okay, let's do that drawing. Here we go. Let's see who is the winner today. Down, 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 down. And Dave Gurner, congratulations. You are the winner. Please send me an email. That link is, well, my email is in the description box below. And let me know if you would prefer a Starbucks or Amazon gift card. But please also send me your YouTube URL as well. When I receive that from you, I will send that e-gift card to you rather shortly. Thank you for everyone watching today's show live, especially on a Sunday instead of on a Friday, changing things up not by design really actually work and school have been wild so had to just kind of push it over just a few days if you enjoyed the show hit the like button subscribe we do so many shows right here every single week that are usually live also follow me on twitter at eyes underscore on the skies for all of my updates and news also follow me on instagram at strange paradigms but if you want to speak to 2000 other like-minded members Follow me, or I guess follow the, the 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 Discord server. I know one of my amazing pods will place that link in the live chat. Share your thoughts, your insights, your experiences, and more. If you are enjoying all the content that you are seeing right here, consider being a Patreon supporter. All the funding goes straight to the channel to Puck the Puck Wedgie for his ramen addiction and for the RV fund where I'll be traveling the United States hitting all the UFO and paranormal hotspots documenting it and taking you on the journey with me that is it for today I will see all of you guys soon be safe and remember keep your eyes on the skies <laughs> <laughs>